Good morning. <laughs> the preacher says good morning. That means talk louder, right? No, I'm teasing. It's a joke. It's a joke. So good to see you today. It's uh, uh, been a very busy, hectic week, and we'll tell you about some of the things going on at the end of the that you're here. Um, many people are on the prayer list, but today, this is God's time. His service, we give him our hearts, we give him our attention. So if you will, bow with me, and uh, if you'd like to join me at the altar, feel free. If, uh, um, if not, you can bow where you are, you can kneel where you are, you can stand. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, habit, but I pray that today will be a time when we will encounter you. We thank you for the victories you've won and how you've led us over this past week. Thank you for what you did in the life of many of our young people last week and what you intend to do this week. But Lord, I pray for this hour. I pray that you'll draw a circle around this building and draw a circle around our hearts individually, and I pray that you would do something, that you would awaken us. That you will awaken them. I pray that you will draw them to yourself. sound of my voice. I pray that today will be the day that you'll draw a circle around them and that you will give them a call in their life that they will respond to you. We give you this day. We give you this hour. We give you ourselves because you are indeed Lord. You are Lord of all. You are Lord of our hearts. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name. Sing this with me. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen.
this song's good as well. Uh, the devil's been working on us this week, I believe. These have been the, this is the hardest service, been the hardest service in songs to put together. Uh, so I, I know this is what the Lord wants because Satan's tried to intervene all, all week in, in something we're doing. So you listen and you praise, you sing along. Thank you. 
much for this day and allowing us to come into your house and worship your holy and precious name. I pray, Lord, that no matter that we know that no matter what we go through, you're right there for us, and that you can see see it through everything that we do. I pray, Lord, that if there's a person in this place that doesn't know you and doesn't have that security of knowing that no matter what they're in, they're not in it alone. I pray, Lord, that you would touch them and burden them so that they would accept you, Lord, into their heart, Lord. I pray, Lord, that that's what it's all about, Lord. It's not about us. It's all about you.
pumped up from these words so strong, will you? Okay? Uh, for what the Lord's done with you. The uh, name of the song is Sea of Victory. It's about what our God can do in our troubles, in our life. And I know each of these had troubles. I have. And it's amazing what God did. And I know he'll do that for you. So you sing.
These are more than songs that we sing. This is, a, this is our philosophy that God's going to show us the victory both individually and collectively. <clears throat> First hour, uh, one of our members, Lucy, sang uh, that if we ever needed you, we need you now. Ever needed the Lord, we need him now. And I believe that. I believe we get so taken with ourselves, and as this uh, scripture will, will unpack for us, that we need him now. So here's what I'd like to do. Would you bow with me in prayer? And let's invite God to be here. Would you just bow with me? Father, we have sensed you through the music. But Lord, we need you now more than ever before. We'll be stubborn. We'll be hard-headed. We'll be selfish. We'll be prideful. But we deeply need you to invade our hearts, to invade our lives, to invade this church, to invade our community. But Lord, right now, I pray specifically that you will invade this service. Have your way among us. Yeah. Now, if you don't know that you know exactly where Agai is, I'm going to give you three possibilities to find it, okay? It, it falls between Zephaniah and Zechariah. Did that help you, Tim? Zephaniah and Zechariah. If that didn't help you, you can go to Matthew in the, in the New Testament, and you can turn left for about three books, Malachi, Zechariah, and Haggai. Or if you can't find um, Haggai, go to your table of contents, and it'll give you the page number, and you'll be able to find it there. Haggai, third from the last book in the Old Testament. Haggai chapter 1. <clears throat> it was around 1970 when a man named Gordon Jensen, a man who would later, I'm glad to say, would become a friend, close acquaintance, uh, wrote these words. He penned these words in around 1970, and every quartet sang them. When I was here last time in, the, in 73, we sang it a lot. Here's the words to the chorus. Signs of the time are everywhere, and there's a brand new feeling in the air. Keep your eyes on the eastern sky, lift up your head, for redemption draweth nigh. You know, the truth is, is that, uh, um, is that he's telling us to look for signs of Jesus' second coming. And here's what I'd like just to tell you today. Jesus is coming again, whether you're ready or not. He's coming again, and we will be judged. You and I will be judged, not on my standards, not on what I want, but on his standards, what he set up in Scripture in the Bible. But signs are a part of our life. In fact, if you look on the screen, you'll see all folks you get so many signs and you see none of them you get signs and 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 you just you don't recognize that they're giving you important information because of what's going on and today from this from our text that we're about to read I want to give you this message don't miss the signs don't miss the signs because there are some very important signs in scripture. These are spiritual signs, not road signs, although they should be a road map for us. If you have found Haggai chapter 1, and you can and you will, would you please stand to honor the reading of God's holy word. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 1, it says, in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. The Lord of armies says this. These people say that they might come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. The word of the Lord came through.
Now, this house, he's talking about the house of the Lord, lies in ruins. Now, about your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never have enough to be happy. You put on clothes, but never have enough to keep warm. The wage earner puts wages into a bag with a hole in it. The Lord of armies says this, think carefully about your ways. Go up into the hills and bring down lumber and build the house. And I will be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You expected much, but then it amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, I ruined it. Why? This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. Because my house still lies in ruins while each of you is busy with his own house. So, on your account, the skies have withheld their dew and the lands its, land its crops. I have summoned a drought on the field and the hills, on the grain you wine fresh oil, and on whatever the ground yields on, on man and animal, on all that your hands produce. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the entire remnant of the people obeyed the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai. Because the Lord their God had sent them, sent him. So the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, delivered the Lord's message to the people. I am with you. This is the Lord's decoration. The Lord roused the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, the spirit of the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. They began work on the house of the Lord of armies, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Father, in the moments that remain, I pray that you would speak to our hearts like you've never spoken before, and that you will not allow us to miss these signs that speak of what you want to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. It is likely that in order for you to really grasp the message that we just read of the, in those 11 verses, that we may need to take just a minute. I know some of you are not history buffs, I'm not particularly a history buff, but it's important for us to know how we got to Haggai chapter 1. Most of you remember in the name King David, he had a son, King Solomon. You remember that King Solomon built, in, in the book of Chronicles, he built this impressive temple. I mean, it was an impressive temple. Years to build. In today's dollars, it would have probably cost between 3 and $4 billion, with a B dollars to erect that temple. You will know from your Sunday school lesson that that temple stood there in Jerusalem for 400 years. Somewhere around close to 586 B.C., remember it's counting down, 586 B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came to Jerusalem, they leveled Jerusalem, they destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple, they took all the sacred things, and King Nebuchadnezzar took the Jewish people in hooks and chains and took them off to Bab Babylon in captivity, where they remained under the iron rule of this pagan king. And by the way, God had worked in the heart of King Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king. He can do that. He's God. Because the reason that they were defeated and carried off into captivity was because they had been disobedient to God. They stayed there for about half a century. And somewhere around 539, King Cyrus of Persia defeated the Babylonians. 
And immediately when he defeated the Babylonians, he began to let the Jewish people return under the leadership of Zerubbabel so they could go back and reestablish the city and rebuild the temple. Well, they were excited, and they went back to town, and they immediately got on this building of the temple. If you were to go, don't go right now while I'm preaching for land sakes, but you can go to the book of Ezra. Look in chapter 3, and what you'll find is that they got the foundation laid. They got the, the foundation, like I picture the slab. They got it put out there. Everybody could see it. And there was a great celebration. Ezra says that the young people, that the young people shouted for joy and that the older priest wept loudly. And the last sentence of chapter 3 says something like this, and the sound was heard far away. There were no sound systems. There was no electronics. But you could hear them far away because they were so excited that the foundation of the temple, the great temple, where God could come and dwell, had been completed. Well, Ezra 4 and 5 is the Baptist part of history. Ezra 4 and 5 shows opposition. will, there will always be opposition. Now, anyway, in Ezra, the opposition came in chapter 4 and 5, and what happened is that the people lost interest. They didn't have thick enough skin. They had other things they wanted to do. Things were going good in their personal lives, so they, 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 they could do other things, and so they just lost interest, and now for 15 years plus, all you could see about of the place where God used to reside, where God used to work, where God used to do his business, all you could see was this massive foundation, almost like an eyesore. And then you get to about 520, 15, 17 years later, and Haggai comes on the scene with a word from the Lord. His preaching, his word is aimed at awakening God's people to God's work, awakening God's people to God's will, awakening God's people to God's plan. And I want to just tell you this today, is that those folks were not doing God's will. They were God's people not doing God's will, and they really didn't realize they weren't doing God's will. Because it's hard to think that you're not doing God's will when you're being blessed so much. But there were some signs that we're going to lift out of here. I want to lift four signs to you out of, out of here. Four signs that I don't want you to miss. Because I think they're not only here, I think they're here in our culture today. First of all, I don't want you to miss the sign of spiritual apathy. You know what apathy is. It's having a don't care. It's having a lack of concern. It's having a lack. You see, spiritual apathy tends to raise its head when things are good. Got money in the bank. Wait. Here's what I'll tell you about apathy. Apathy breeds abandonment. When you get apathetic, you think nothing about walking away. As I thought about this as I was preparing this message, just having come out of the Southern Baptist Convention, hearing some of the words there, I'll give a report Wednesday night on, and answer some questions. But I wonder if this apathy that leads to abandonment is the very reason that church membership is dropping, why baptisms are down, why attendance is down. It's gotten so good that we really don't care anymore. We can kind of come and go as we want to. Question is, how can followers of Christ, people who...
When God tells you to do something, tells you to do something, you know he's told you to do something, but because it really doesn't matter to you, you choose to do what you want to instead. I mean, verse 3 kind of highlights that. Is it a time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? If I were to put it in a 21st century question, I would go, is it really time? Is it really time for you yourself to make it all about you and your desires and not what God's told you to do? For you see, God tells us to do some things. God tells us to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Hello, as is the manner of some. God, God tells us to be faithful, to be committed. Jesus said, take up your cross and deny self. The mantra today is take up self and deny the cross. Now the tragedy is, any time we resist anything, we become calloused. You see, apathy breeds callousness. to the cause of Christ. We're ap- then we become apathetic to the lostness of people. We really don't care. Then we get apathetic to those folks around us who are in need. And it becomes all about us in here. And then when church takes action and church does things, when the church body looks about doing things, all they want to do is, what's in it for me? as opposed to what's in me for it. Resisting God's word is easy. Brother Jerry, been a member for a lot of years. Well, that's good. I never heard such like this. We do this church the way we want to. Now, I'm just going to tell you, nobody's ever said that to me at this place. Okay? Nobody. But it could be an attitude. We just do it for ourselves. We try to do it. This is God's church. Could I get an amen? This is God's church. And we get apathetic when we resist God's word. We get, an, we get apathetic when we replace there to build the house. He they put it off. They procrastinate. They put it off. They procrastinate. You see, God says, do this. And we go, well, we can't do that. It won't work. Or we should wait on doing it. That's what happened here. And may I just suggest that's what happened many times in the local church. First sign of opposition. We choose to replace God's word. We choose to resist God's word. That's what they did. It's a lesson for us. Now, before you get really judgmental and before you get really indignant of what these people do, I I think we ought to consider what's going on today in the church. Now, I'm going to say something. If this don't fit you, don't put the shoe on your foot. Because if you put a shoe on your foot that it's not meant for you, it's going to hurt. But at the same time, if this shoe fits you and you put it on, it may hurt. Because this is what we know today. The average church member spends little time. Let me say it this way. The average American church member spends little time praying. 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 Except for... God is great, God is good. Let me thank him for our food. Our Lord bless all these, bless all the people and bless our food. Amen.
or the average church member since a little time in Bible study, personal Bible study. I, I said this hour. I know somebody will say something to me down the road, but one of the I understand when they did it. It was one of those things that that we put out there to help people. I understand that, but that seven point system. That's caused many, much, many people to sin because, you know, it has on their daily Bible reading. You remember that? And somebody get up and they'd read two verses. I can check it off because I read the Bible today. And that's not really what discipleship is all about. Discipleship is investing yourself in the Bible. You understand that whatever you invest yourself in has a return on it. Before I pass this, I have to, you know, people don't spend time in prayer, don't spend time in Bible reading. And there are many church members who live their entire life and they never, ever share what Jesus has done for them with anyone else. That's replacing God's word. That's birth out of spiritual apathy. Or, I just want to... I'll pause here to say this, is that when Jesus comes into your life, it's, there's a change. He changes you from the inside out. Somebody next to me said, I last week and I'm getting baptized are you going to go and I said I'm, on, I'm there Bang! I went up and I gave the preacher all the right answers but nothing happened in here here's what I'm going to say to you the only thing you have in your life is that you walked an aisle, you took the preacher by the hand you prayed a prayer, you went through a small swimming pool and got dunked in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit if that's all you got, if that's all of your Christian life at the end of the day, in that day, as Jesus said, you're going to come up short and you're not going to like it. Because you see, when Jesus comes into your life, your life is changed from the inside out. Can I, I can't even imagine having that kind of life change and not at least sharing it some level at some point in my life. Every time I, every time I mention this, somebody goes, preacher, don't get too excited about that. Well, let me tell you something. I am, I am concerned about the number of people who, who claim to know Christ and have nothing to show for it. Because a walk with Christ is not just sitting in a pew or a Sunday school class. It's not just walking through the waters of baptism. It's about giving your heart and soul to Him. I don't even know. I didn't do that first hour. I don't even know if I needed to hear that today. Apathy comes from us replacing and resisting God. Mass of your muscle, it brings about weakness. Spiritual atrophy is when you lose spiritual strength and lose spiritual sensitivity. Why? Because of lack of use. Two things will drive that. Number one is dissatisfaction. That's what we find here. Number one is dissatisfaction. You find it here. The, the truth is, I preached this text for some preachers many years ago about how to prepare for ministry. And as I was working through it, three things came to my mind is that these people, these people were insubordinate. Time has not come. It's not time to build a house. These people were inept. You planted little. You planted much, but you harvested little. These, these men, these people were not only inept, It's just never enough. And the truth is, I told this first hour, for transparency, back in 2002, I was diagnosed with chemical depression. And I will say this for all the people whose mouths drop, preacher got chemical depression. I'll tell you something, this is a body, it's chemical. 
you get deficient in a chemical, you won't even be able to think right. And so if you're battling chemical depression, get to your doctor and take what he, t what he asks you to get. And if you don't get it right the first time, you can go through eight, nine, or ten medicines before you get it right. But here's what I'm going to tell you. He gave me, he gave me an antidepressant. And I got better here. But you know what the antidepressant did? It made me feel like both of my legs were hollow. And I had to fill them with food. And I ate, and I ate, and I ate. And I put, and the only thing happened, my belly got bigger and it won't go away. I put on weight. But I was never satisfied. You know what the truth is? Sin is like that. When you abandon the Lord, resist the Lord, replace the Lord in your life, what will happen is that dissatisfaction, it will grow and grow and grow. It will never satisfy. Because, listen, Sin always promises you something big, and it never delivers. How many times have I had men or women sit across the desk from me and tell me, I'm having this adulterous relationship, but God understands. May I say this to you? No, he doesn't. What he understands is that sin that caused him the death of his only son. Dissatisfaction always leads to disappointment. Always leads to disappointment. You see, the, the text says you got the wage earner puts money, puts, uh, puts his wages into a bag with a hole in it. Now, can I just kind of get a smile here? Is anybody in this room, you ever kind of make your money, get your money, and you put it somewhere and it feels like a hole in your pocket? Anybody? Oh, got the spiritual types here today. Never. That. It's, there's something always going wrong. That's the material side. How about the spiritual side? Verse 9 says, You expected much, but it has amounted to little. When apathy controls your life, atrophy sits in and you will discover that it affects your thinking. And that's why two times in this text, he says, think carefully about your ways. God says, think carefully. And when you get into trouble, you know what happens? When you're in sinful trouble. By the way, your, your mind doesn't work right if you're, if you're living in sin today. Your mind doesn't work right. David all he did was just not go to war, and his mind didn't work right. And he, committed, he probably broke seven or eight of the Ten Commandments, the man after God's own heart, because he wasn't thinking right. You see, you see the, the deal is, is, that, is that sin will control you, take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and make you pay more than you want to pay. He says, you better think about what you're doing. My message to you today is we better think about what we're doing. Better consider it carefully. My daddy told me to think about it. I did, but if he told me a second time, I knew I was in trouble. If you don't, do you know what the outcome of your life and my life will be? We'll play the Adam game. The Adam game is to blame everybody else. Blame somebody else for what's going on. It's walking with Jesus. I'm going to say that again. It's walking with Jesus. I don't mean walking away from Jesus. I don't mean walking to Jesus' house just on Sunday. I mean walking with Jesus every day. Jesus calls us to follow him. Jesus calls us to follow him. Hello? Jesus calls us to follow him. We commit our lives to him because he died for us on the cross. And then we follow him. Apathy and atrophy. 
Let me give you the third sign. This is what I pray for. And if you do this and you begin to wake, I'm going to give you two quick ones. Hang on with me. Number one, it will cause you to recognize the problem that you have. It will rec- cause you to recognize the problem. If you look down at verse 9, he says, You expected much, but it amounted to little. When I brought the harvest to your house, watch this, I ruined it. God ruined it. Did you hear that? You think things are going good and God ruins it. Why is that? Because he says, my house lies in ruins. Here it is. My house is in ruins because you have placed yourself above me. These folks had... had been returned to their place and and that was the tent they had they wanted to come back and build the temple that was the temple today it's the kingdom god has enlisted in it and invited and engaged and commanded us to be involved in his kingdom's work but those folks had it so good that that even though they had been rescued they now become so enamored with themselves that obedience to him and that building his temple and his kingdom didn't register. They had a problem with God. Today I suggest, I submit that we have a problem with God. He's calling us. He wants to engage us. He doesn't just want us to tip our hand to him once a week. He wants us to be committed to him. That's why Jesus died. When awakening happens, you recognize the problem, and the second thing is you realize the penalty. Verse 10 and 11 basically says, it's your fault that a famine's coming. I believe we're living in a famine today. It may not be a physical famine. We've had plenty of water, rain. But could it be the reason that we have not walked in the Spirit? Could the reason that the Spirit's not so prevalent could it be that we have atrophy and, and apathy and we don't realize what it's cost us? Could the reason that so many are suffering so much, even inside the church, be because of lack of obedience? Could, could it be that our lack of passion for discipleship is the fallout for us putting other gods before him? Churches are closing today. It seems that they'd rather close their doors than to do things God's way. You and I are more financially blessed than we ever thought possible. But money, while good, did not, does not mean a God's blessing. I'll say this to you. It's high time for judgment to begin at the house of God. I believe it's Peter that tells us that. Spiritual awareness. Are you aware of what's going on spiritually around you? And finally, don't miss the sign of spiritual awakening. I really don't have time to develop this like I'd like, but I will just tell you that if you look here in verse 14, it says, The Lord roused the spirit of Zerubbabel, aroused the spirit of Joshua, aroused the spirit of of the people. That's awakening with respect to everyone in this room. That's what we need today. We need to get as excited about Jesus and what he wants to do for us. Gotham. We need to get as excited for him about what he wants to do. You see, God stirred his words. God stirred it. He stirred their hearts. 
He stirred them by Haggai. He stirred them by his spirit. And I'd like to think God wants to stir our hearts. When he does, you know what will happen? Not only will it be roused by him, but we'll gain more respect for him. I'm just telling you today, I don't think there's much respect for God. If you find this down, I just closed my Bible. We find this down at the end of verse, verse number 12. It says, so the people feared the Lord. I'm sad to say that in this modern day culture, most people don't have a fear for the Lord. Have a fear for somebody, you respect them. You respond. You know, my daddy died a little over a year ago. He was almost 90 years old. He'd been in a you know, um, wheelchair for a number of years. Daddy couldn't have taken me physically at that point. But my dad built in me a healthy respect for him. And I would have never crossed him for anything in the world. I don't, do we have that kind of respect for the Lord today? They feared the Lord, so they walked in his... Because in that day, there'll be no decisions made. The decisions made today about that day. They feared the Lord. And then I will end with this. The sign of spiritual awakening will be roused or stirred. We'll have respect or fear. But lastly, that we'll respond. Aren't you, their response to the Lord. It tells you down there that they began work on the house of the Lord. I want to say this again. Back then it was a temple. Today it's his kingdom. And his kingdom are filled with people. His people. And who are invited? All are invited. How do they get there? Are you awakened? I will say this. Awakening takes different forms with different people. Some people, when the alarm clock goes off, the cover goes off, and they run for the bathroom because they're already in the day. Some people have to have their coffee. Hello? Some people, some people, it takes them a while to wake up. But I'm asking you today, are you being awakened by the power and the presence and the Spirit of God? And I'd like to think that we as a church, that God is beginning to shake us. It's probably what we'll talk about in two weeks, but shake us, stir us, and rouse us. If you've never trusted Christ, I want you to be a part of that. Maybe he's shaking you today. that we serve you, that we follow you, and that we rule the world. In Jesus' name, amen. If you never trusted Christ, we stand to sing. I'll be down here. You can make your way to whatever I was closest to you, and I'll be glad to talk with you about it. If, you want, if you're interested in being a church member, you come see me, and I'll talk with you about how to start the process. Altar will be open. Maybe you need to talk to the Lord. Whatever God puts on your heart, Praise your respond today. Let's stand and you come on the first word of the song.
Heavenly Father, I pray that we will bring it all to you and give it to you. Thank you for this day, this time of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you move, I, just, I hate to do this, but I have several things you need to know about. First of all, deacons, you have a meeting at 4 o'clock this afternoon. And I hope you'll be here at 5 o'clock. We have our, our, our new member welcome and our uh, war room. It's a movie night. We hope that you'll come. Uh, ladies, you can bring some finger foods. We'll have popcorn and some, some things to drink. We gather in the fellowship hall for movie night. I hope you'll be here. I'm looking. I hope we have a, a big crowd. Um, we think we'll have services on Wednesday, but uh, we got a we got young people leaving for camp in the morning. We got student. We got children leaving Tuesday morning. I got children getting back uh, Wednesday morning and students getting back Thursday morning, and they will do that over here. I'm going to ask parents and everybody to kind of uh, be uh, cautious about the parking lot. We really don't want to mess up striping or or anything like that. So if you'll help us with that, we'll appreciate it. Men, I'm going to tell you tomorrow night, uh, and you know Mike's not here. Tomorrow night there is a brotherhood meeting, and they're leaving, and I don't know. Eric, did he say first hour what time they're leaving? I don't remember. Evan, did he say what time they're leaving tomorrow? Uh, I, I recognize that. Oh, you don't have a you don't have a clue. Okay. Do what? Okay. Okay. All right. But uh, uh, a lot of things going on Saturday night. This is this is Saturday night. We have a fish fry in honor of Brother Evan and Hannah. And so I believe that's at 5 o'clock. And so you come, and we're going to have a great time together. If you have any questions, please call Beth in the office. I think I got it all this time. I did. Okay. Let's sing our way out. We'll be done. God bless you for being here. hope you have a great week. My and our grandkids are here today, so I hope you're welcome.